how to respond to situations of racism and xenophobia affecting displaced and stateless persons. We have received, I must say, numerous requests from you, from colleagues in the field in the recent months, that it would be good to have an opportunity to have a dedicated session on racism and xenophobia. And this is why we are here today. And so that everybody feels comfortable and we can uh, maximize this session, we would like to ask, uh, please, that uh, you keep your microphones on mute. Uh, so that we can uh, hear each other and uh, not to have too many disruptions. But on the contrary, we invite you to be very active in the chat. So you can share your comments, observations, ideas, questions, examples. We will be constantly monitoring the chat so that we can also bring your examples and questions to the panelists and, uh, and get some reflections on them. So we invite you strongly to use the chat across along the, the session. So with that, I will, we are actually very fortunate today because we have several distinguished guests uh, that joined us, starting from uh, Madeleine Garlick, who is the head of protection policy and legal advice section in the Division of International Protection in UNHCR who will uh, share with us the welcoming and opening remarks uh, to the webinar, but also present the guide that UNHCR is launching on racism and xenophobia, followed by three panelists. And uh, we will start with Mona Rishmawi, who is the Chief of Rule of Law, Equality and Non-Discrimination Branch in OHCHR, followed by Gay McDowell, who was actually the first UN Special Rapporteur at the time, independent expert on minority issues and vice chair uh, also of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, CERT, that many of you know very well. And uh, we will hear also from our dear colleague Juan Pablo Terminiello, who will share with us uh, perspectives from the Regional Bureau in Americas on how they tackle and respond to situations of racism and xenophobia. We will actually change the order starting from Gay, then going to Mona and then Juan Pablo. But without any further delay, I would like to give the floor to Madeline. Over to you, please. Thank you very much, Valerie. And really, let me thank all participants sincerely for joining us today. I'd also like to extend particular thanks to all of the colleagues who were involved in preparing this webinar, including notably our co-convener, the UN Network on Racial Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. There's clearly considerable momentum around the need to tackle racism and xenophobia as recent events and public debates in many countries have highlighted. What we see is clearly a recognition of the need to address the phenomena of racism, xenophobia and related intolerance in their many forms and to work on fostering greater tolerance and inclusion. The COVID-19 pandemic, I think, has brought starkly to light systematic inequalities and barriers, including many linked to racism and xenophobia in some contexts, which have hindered access to testing and treatment or resulted in stigmatization and targeted measures that can threaten people's lives. It's thus very timely for us to come together today. I'd like to recall the three main aims of our discussion that have been included in the invitation to today's meeting. Firstly, to seek to share and exchange on the role and experiences of many of the stakeholders that are taking part today as concerns racism and protection of minorities in the course of their work. Secondly, we'd like to advance thinking on development of practical strategies and efforts to prevent and address racism and xenophobia affecting displaced and stateless persons, amongst others. And third and finally, we'd like to draw from the guidance that UNHCR has published, which is being presented today, but also from the perspectives of experts and other participants in order to enable us to identify more opportunities for collaboration in support of displaced and stateless populations affected by racism and xenophobia. As some further brief background to the discussion, I think it's worth recalling that from UNHCR's view, point of view, this issue has a specific resonance and priority for us. This comes about firstly because racism and related intolerance are frequently root causes of displacement. Secondly, however, 
they can compromise and undermine the protection that is and needs to be afforded to you and HCR's persons of concern. For example, they may manifest themselves through official restrictions on access to asylum or territory or inadequate standards of treatment afforded to those seeking asylum or recognised as refugees or otherwise in need of international protection. We also see that displaced persons may be denied the full enjoyment of their human rights in some contexts, which can hamper the achievement of durable solutions, including through opportunities to integrate effectively and to contribute to their host communities. Furthermore, we see instances in which discrimination on the basis of race, colour, descent or national, national or ethnic origin can be a recurring reason for the depri dep deprivation or denial of nationality and therefore can be a cause of statelessness in many cases. UNHCR is strongly committed to working with key partners on countering xenophobia, racism and related intolerance. In line with its human rights engagement strategy, UNHCR collaborates closely with relevant UN human rights mechanisms, OHCHR, and regional and national organisations in order to combat these phenomena. Amongst the other fora in which we do this is the uh, Network on Racial Discrimination and Minorities as a key partner and our co-convener. Allow me now to present some key elements from UNHCR's recently issued guidance on racism and xenophobia, addressing the ways in which UNHCR can address and respond more effectively to situations of racism and xenophobia affecting persons under its mandate. The guide aims to equip UNHCR operations, as well as its partners, as it's a public document, more effectively to identify, prevent and respond where needed to racism and xenophobia affecting our persons of concern. Recognising that these challenges are not new and that there is much good work that we can draw upon, which has been done in the past, the guide builds on UNHCR's 2009 strategic approach to combating racial, racist, uh, racism, race, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance. These uh, already identified a number of concrete areas listed on the slide there in which colleagues were encouraged and took concrete action over the past decade in order to try and advance on these issues. So drawing on the experience of uh, efforts to implement this strategic approach, as well as geopolitical developments, improved and uh, deepened thinking and experience since then, the 2020 HCR guide, amongst other things, Moving to the next slide, seeks to define a number of key concepts relating to the prevention of and response to racism and related intolerance, including principles of equality and non-discrimination, racism, prejudice, stigma, intolerance, hate speech and hate crimes, recognising that there are many different understandings of these notions and that it's important to seek to have some common approaches as the basis for addressing them. The guide then, moving to the next slide, seeks to broaden UNHCR's engagement through a multi-stakeholder approach, which also of course reflects and seeks to implement the logic of the Global Compact on Refugees. It seeks to provide a comprehensive legal and policy framework for UNHCR's interventions regarding racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance. And in doing so, proposes four building blocks, which aim to underpin a comprehensive human rights-based multi-vector and multi-actor approach. The guide proposes seven directions which UNHCR seeks to follow in addressing racism and xenophobia, both it's in, in, in its internal policies and programs, as well as its external and wider engagements and platforms. It then seeks to call for a broader, more strategic and systemic commitment and engagement through these directions. Next slide, please. And it's six, uh, you have here set out then what those directions are, uh, highlighted also in light of the historical racism, the structural racism, institutional racism and individual racism on which the guide also seeks to provide a background. All of this in a context which recognises the intersectionality of some of these issues and the need for an intersectional approach also to addressing them effectively. I commend this table as well as the other key content elements that I have outlined here to your attention. You are welcome to look at them further in the document itself, which is publicly available and on which you have the link posted there in the chat box by Peter. So 
I, we'd like to move then from here to a discussion, hearing from our experts on some of these issues and also hoping to hear from all of you about ways in which UNHCR can improve its engagement working with partners in this key area. Before we move to that, I'd like, however, to sincerely commend colleagues and operations for their efforts so far within UNHCR to address this issue, as well as the strong interest that they have shown in the development of this guide and ensuring that its provisions and its content are as practical and as relevant as possible to the operational challenges which they're addressing today. It's going to be translated into Arabic, French and Spanish, and we hope this will also increase its utility and accessibility for colleagues all around the world. We've heard many times in internal discussions over recent months how acutely relevant these issues are to UNHCR's work worldwide and how appreciative colleagues are of new tools and uh, sources of inspiration to strengthen and improve their skills and their strategies to address this. We hope now to improve that further today in light of the insights we're going to hear and we look forward very much to hearing our expert speakers and their perspectives and thoughts on this for UNHCR and its partners in working in this area. Thank you so much and looking forward to the discussion. Over to you, Valerie. Thank you so much, uh, Madeline, for this uh, very inspiring uh, opening, but also outlining the guide and an important piece for our discussion today and beyond. With that, I will uh, pass the floor directly to Gay McDowell. As I mentioned before, uh, the first uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. Uh, at the time, you were the independent expert, uh, but also uh, as a former vice chair of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Over to you, Gay, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, good night to um, uh, each and all of you. I'm very happy to have been asked to um, spend this a little We can hear you well. I uh, know, I think. Uh, I think you've been muted. Okay. Now it's okay. Um, okay. So again, um, I want to um, thank you for the invitation to join um, you. Um, and um, I also want to congratulate uh, the network uh, on the success of its work um, on this guide, but also over the years on uh, a number of projects that have work to break down the silos of, first of all, of knowledge, of contact, of operations uh, between all the different, uh, you know, areas of the UN and really begin to share knowledge and share approaches in a, a, an important way. Um, and combating racism and xenophobia, uh, as you all know, as Madeline emphasized in her introduction, you know, these are among the most important goals of the United uh, Nations of international uh, community and uh, were a central impetus for the formation uh, of the uh, United Nations. But still, um, in this era, uh, in this next century, uh, we find that uh, not only is uh, racism and xenophobia, not only are they uh, really uh, still threatening every uh, collective human endeavor around the world, um, I would say that over the past decade, they've been uh, rising and spiking in uh, incredible uh, ways. Um, if you were to ask members of the uh, committee, uh, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racism that I, I sat on for eight years. Um, what, what's been uh, the most deviling um, uh, problem? Uh, the one that has come up most in our country uh, reviews over the last, uh, say, decade, it would be uh, the um, consequences of the flows of people, the movement of extraordinary numbers of people from the global south to uh, countries 
uh, in the north. Um, and, uh, you know, this uh, unprecedented flow of people, as you know, I think better than I, uh, in important ways uh, has been the root cause that racism and xenophobia and differences among groups been the root cause of some of these uh, massive flows, but also as they touch on their on new societies as they move uh, uh, northern uh, and they move through countries of transit um, and their final places of settlement. Um, they tend to, you know, especially if there are weak leaders in uh, those countries and along the way, uh, these phenomena tend to exacerbate uh, tensions that have been pre-existing uh, in those societies and in uh, those countries. And so uh, new uh, communities of people tend to become scapegoats. Uh, for um, long existing uh, problems. Uh, and I am uh, sure that in the work of UNHCR, uh, this is front and center. Um, in the work of CERT, it has certainly uh, been over uh, the past, say, decade, front and center. And we, like you, have had to um, think anew about ways that uh, we uh, could deal effectively within the scope of our mandate uh, with the problems presented uh, from uh, these new situations of uh, migrant flows. Uh, some countries came to us and say, well, actually, this is not a part of your mandate. Um, uh, and uh, we were taken aback. Uh, because it is in the black letter of uh, the uh, International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, but it has not been the focus of much of our practice uh, until recently. So um, I think it's, it, it, it's very important uh, this initiative. Um, and I hope that, and I look forward to it uh, bringing uh, closer collaboration between members of CERD and the work of CERD, um, the work of the Unit on uh, Minorities, and UNHCR, both in headquarters and uh, in the uh, field. There are a number of things that I really like about this guy. And I just want to focus on a couple of them because I, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, first of all, uh, the, uh, the uh, section on key concepts, I think is really extraordinarily good as it takes into account uh, the uh, uh, the black letter, if you will, of uh, many of the uh, instruments, legal instruments that we deal with, not only uh, the um, uh, ICER, the International Convention, uh, but the Declaration on the Rights of uh, Minorities um, and other uh, conventions, as well as those um, conventions that are directly on point uh, with the questions of uh, refugees um, and uh, stateless uh, persons. Uh, there is uh, a lot from the Inter-American um, Convention Against Racism and Racial Discrimination and Related Intolerance, a, a document that I was somewhat involved in the development of. Uh, it is still relatively new among um, such legal documents, uh, but very uh, relevant um, and important, especially uh, in, uh, uh, in the Americas. Uh, 
but even further as a, uh, a, a sort of example of how new thinking is uh, handling these um, uh, issues. Um, I think that it is very good. The, uh, the work that has been put in on the question of um, intersectionality. Um, I, um, very few <laughs> uh, understand it, <laughs> which uh, I find interesting, uh, but um, I think the contextual uh, section of uh, the guide, which looks at issues of um, uh, intersectionality, of which which puts things in context of uh, power dynamics and systems of uh, oppression, uh, and understanding how uh, multi-sectorial, if you will, uh, all of our lives are and all of these communities are, and uh, beginning to think about how um, that can be actually uh, dealt with. And the question of historical um, injustices, uh, both uh, historical injustices that may have been the root causes of those who move and the historical uh, injustices that are a part of the realities of communities that they move to and the way those dynamics um, interplay uh, when uh, new people, new communities come into uh, societies well-formed and uh, who have uh, developed uh, in ways good and bad of, um, of approaching uh, the realities of their histories. Um, you know, so I think it is, um, it is an unusual document in trying to put all that forward in one guide to say, look at this, these are realities that uh, have to be dealt with. It's hard to, um, uh, it is hard to give uh, clear steps on how you take all of that into account because it presents in such different ways uh, in uh, every uh, unique uh, set of circumstances. But it's very rare to have a document that says to people, you must think about all of these dynamics on the ground and you must work with a wide range of people who have their own expertise uh, and who um, can bring something of value to you in working out these uh, problems in uh, uh, the ways that uh, make uh, uh, important um, differences uh, to your work. Now I've got a, there's much more to say about this. I'm not going to go through all, but I will say that the um, examples then that you give uh, from um, actual situations that have taken place and how uh, they have been dealt with, I think also is uh, of uh, extraordinary value and uh, can be and should be used in a lot of different contexts, not just UNHCR. Uh, finally, I will say this, that um, I'm happy to see uh, the section that um, considers how uh, UNHCR uh, can and should uh, work uh, uh, in different ways. Um, with the Committee on the Elimination of Racial uh, Discrimination. Uh, as you know, we've had interactions uh, for quite a, a long time 
as UNHCR uh, personnel have come to uh, the sessions of CERT and have given us uh, briefings about uh, various countries that we might be reviewing at that time. Um, but I think, you know, let's let's face it. When uh, during the three sessions a year that CERT has had um, so far, uh, we are under, I say we, I still think I'm no longer on CERT, but still, <laughs> under extraordinary uh, time pressure uh, to deal and attempt to deal adequately with a incredible workload. And that is unfortunate given the uh, importance of the issues uh, that we try to uh, cope with. That having been said, um, I really would love to see a deeper, a more thoughtful interaction between uh, UNHCR um, and uh, the committee. And I see from this work ways that that could be structured, even if it is through a sort of a yearly seminar uh, of some sort, or if uh, you think about uh, restructuring the presentation formats of uh, UNHCR to sir, so that it goes along this line. Because at this point, uh, we rarely have um, a um, we rarely have clear thoughts about uh, your addressing situations of. Um, racism and xenophobia. Uh, rather, what we hear are um, how you feel the host countries are failing obligations under uh, the, um, uh, the legal instruments that are directly relevant to uh, refugee status or statelessness status. Uh, and with the little time that we have, it's hardly enough uh, for us to go into an in-depth conversation uh, along the lines of the, um, you know, of the uh, uh, of the outline of the guide uh, that you present about how these situations really come out of and feed into. Uh, a larger paradigm of, uh, of racism and xenophobia. We have to have that discussion. It's very important. Um, and I hope uh, that we will all be able to think together about ways uh, that that kind of uh, fruitful uh, interaction um, can be had. So thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much, you so much. Jay, uh, for offering some of the opportunities UNHCR could see as well to strengthen the collaboration with uh, uh, the committee, but also to depicting some of the key highlights from the guide and notably um, references to intersectionality, its importance, as well as working in partnerships and many others. Thank you very much for sharing also your experience. And speaking about partnerships, I would like to give the floor to Mona Rishmawi, who is the chief of the Rule of Law, Equality and Non-Discrimination Branch in uh, OHCHR. Thank you very much. Uh, Mona, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you see me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Very good, very good, because I had to do a few maneuvers. Thank you, and it's really a real pleasure to join the colleagues with UNH in UNHCR, particularly the colleagues who work on the field, and my dear friend Gay, who is always a pleasure to see her. Uh, she's such a... Uh, I don't want to say she's such an institution, because she's uh, she's uh, she, she has so much knowledge and so much information about this uh, this issue and moving the work for the protection of minorities and ra racism. So what the remarks that she just delivered and her observations uh, come out of really many years of experience 
of really pushing these issues uh, at the UN level uh, in the context of human rights, but also at the country level. Um, many of you may know or may not know uh, Gay was extremely involved in the anti-apartheid movement, so her work goes back to th those years when she was uh, really uh, uh, in that in that front, and now she's very much part of the this discussion on the rights of people of African descent in the United States. So another big challenge that is uh, ahead of us uh, uh, these days. So thank you very much, and thank you, thank you very much, Gay, also for for the, uh, for for your excellent remarks. I just want to have I, I have five main points that I will make. You know. Uh, one after another. One is that we sometimes forget this, but actually racial discrimination is in, a, in our charter. You know, protection against racial discrimination is our charter. It's one of the foundations of both uh, the United Nations as a whole, but also uh, for the protection of uh, refugees already as it started from the League of Nations times. It was one of the few institutions actually that could do something about minorities was the, was the, uh, was the, uh, the refugee office which was started during the era. So you as UNHCR has a long history in the protection of minorities and they have a long history in protecting individuals who have been, uh, you know, who are uh, fleeing persecution. Uh, uh, in that. And we should always remember that because you see, uh, for for some some countries or some states would say this is a politically charged issue. These are difficult issues. We can't really discuss these issues in the, in in a uh, in, in our terms, and I, I think we need to always, as UN officials, remind ourselves that this is core mandate. This is our charter. This is our core mandate. We have to go to places and basically look very carefully at whether the identity of individuals and groups actually affect how they are treated and how their human rights is, uh, is delivered. And unfortunately, and that's my second point, unfortunately, and UNHCR knows this extremely better, very, very well, and as well as we know it in, in OHCHR, um, unfortunately, many individuals in many countries are treated on the basis of their identity, not what they do, or, but on who they are. So national identities and ethnic identities and racial identities are really, really core to how, unfortunately, states de uh, uh, decide to realize rights or not for people. And as as we know, you know, policies uh, based on rejection of identity is basically is often uh, we see it and ends up in displacement, the, uh, uh, in statelessness, uh, uh, ends up with really very, very concrete and very difficult uh, situations that we as the United Nations, you know, creates so-called humanitarian crisis, which as you can imagine, as you know, they are more, they are human rights crisis because these are crises about how human beings are treated. Uh, so we have to always be very aware of that, that this is really something that we need to work with all the time. The problem, as we all know and as we face, is that many times the policies are masked with, uh, in, in ways that makes it a bit difficult for us to challenge it. So, so they don't come and say we are treating people badly because they belong to this ethnic group or this minority or, or, or they say it's anti-terrorism, it's protection of the national security, it's, it's about our nationality law, it's about, it's, our, it's, about, it's about immigration flow or migration flow, it's about how do we control our borders. So it makes it a bit more complicated for us to engage when it is not so out there in your face, so, so to speak. So uh, I think um, w that's why I feel that your guidance, the guidance that you just had, is extremely important because it gives tools to tell, to tell us, to tell UNHCR 
but also its partners. I really think, I really think like what Gay said, this is really pioneering. And even us for OHCHI, we can benefit a lot from that that guidance that you put together. So I think it's it's really very well done. And I was particularly touched on that. I was particularly touched by how you uh, how the guidance looked at um, li the drivers to uh, what drive what drives us to understand racism. So basically, the various relationships that. Are uh, are constructed around it, and I think that's that's. I think I haven't seen that being spelled out the way you spelled it out in that guidance. We see it a lot, you know, access to host communities and no, no, not to discriminate between the host communities and the uh, displaced communities and why and there is how the resentment uh, around these issues develop. But you, I, I like how you how it is put put out, you know, that the relationship between each group of refugees and the host communities, um, that it's often, it's, there is often a bit of racial prejudices around that, uh, around that hampers uh, relationships about who benefits and who doesn't. Uh, and if we work with a certain group, it's this is, I mean, uh, I'm just throwing it out there, not because this, you know, the Rohingyas versus the people who are, uh, who are in that host community, the Syrians versus uh, the Lebanese villagers who are hosting them and all this stuff creates a bit of uh, res resentment. And I like how you actually mention that. I think that's really important. Um, the relationship between returnees and local communities. You know, you be, you uh, these were the, those were people who were benefiting from international protection and how the international protection was given to them and how they are facilitated to return and what is the relationship between that. I thought putting your hand on that that's also very very important. The relationship between the groups of internal displaced persons and the IDPs uh, and um, uh, uh, and and as well as uh, within the groups themselves within the refugees because we all we kind of like assume and you see this in a number of uh, of countries you assume that when people are displaced and so on I remember that in my work on Darfur very 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 well you assume that you are in an IDP or a refugee camps and everybody everything is homogeneous but as UNHCR knows very very well uh, the, that the tribal and ethnic relationships actually dominates a lot what happens there. So I think the guidance, the guidance that you are given here to look to look at it from basically how can we go beyond this pre prejudice? How can a, a UNHCR uh, operational, operational uh, 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 colleagues uh, look at it also being very aware of these dynamics? So I really, really uh, commend you and commend you and HCR on this. My third point, which uh, uh, I want to mention quite, quite uh, quickly, but I think uh, it's really important to me, is that this, I mean, we are at a stage now and we saw it a lot with Black Lives Matters and what was happening around uh, racial justice and I was, uh, uh, you know, yesterday we also the inauguration and I was like almost counting how many times the word racial justice was actually mentioned. And it's quite, it's, it's, it was quite frequent by uh, the new president of the United States. And I was thinking, would we have seen that like th th uh, 10 years ago? No, we wouldn't have seen that uh, 10 years ago. We see it today because people are standing up for their rights. People are saying enough is enough. And I think we as the United Nations need to be part of this movement of legitimizing, legitimizing the, the struggle against, uh, against uh, uh, racism and race, racial justice, because as I say, it's a core issue for us. So all this stuff that is happening around uh, around uh, the killing of George Floyd, around the Black Lives Matters, and around the movement around it throughout the world, that I see it as a global movement standing up for, for, uh, for not only 
personal rights, but for each other's rights and for each other's dignity. So, and I think that's really important when we are working in areas which are not as exposed as a, someone in New York or in Chicago and so on, and they have the TV cameras and so on. Someone who's, what is happening in places, in really far away places that are not subject to uh, TV cameras and social media and so on. I think the same phenomena happens in many, many countries. It's just we don't see it. So, and we are discovering this very much as we are working uh, to uh, to unpack what uh, uh, you know the relationship between law enforcement and racism and how law enforcement looks at racism and systemic racism and conditions of life that have cre uh, that create that space i think that becomes extremely important the point that i want to stress don't look at it that this is happening in New York or happening in Washington and happening in London or in uh, somewhere, uh, you know. It is also happening in places that very close to home and we where we are working and we need just to keep our eyes open and we need uh, to make sure that we are actually taking in what the messages that the communities are, are, are actually telling us even if, uh, uh, especially as a recipient communities for, for our, uh, for our, uh, uh, so a lot of, a lot of stuff is happening around that. Again, it's happening because it's, uh, it's clearly because states are engaged because there is a human rights council, but from our side as an office, we are really trying to dig up, to dig into places where might not be under the spotlight. So with that, I would like to really call on you if you uh, feel that there are countries or situations that we need to look at it from that point of view, from that diamet from that angle, please don't hesitate to send an email to people, to colleagues in UNHCR at the headquarters. They know how to re reach us, but also to me and Claude, my colleague who's, uh, who's on the call. And don't hesitate to reach out to us, uh, even reach out to Gay, she'll, she'll let me know, she'll let us know. So don't hesitate to reach, uh, to reach out to us and to say, actually, have you looked at this situation? This, there, is, there is something happening here, here that we need to look at. And my uh, fourth point, and it's really a quick fourth point, if I can find it, is, uh, is, is to remind of two things that are happening and I'll, just, and I'll, my fifth point is the network, which I will end with. But my fourth point is to remind that uh, of of basically that the SG himself has has spoken out and has put something that he's calling a call to action. And within that, he's asking for he's basically wants us to develop what we call an agenda for protection. And in articulating that agenda for protection, and clearly you can imagine Volker is in the executive offices of the Secretary General, you can imagine you guys are at the center of this. In, that, in formulating that agenda for protection, the rights of minorities, indigenous people, uh, he didn't mention Afro-descent, but they are, they, for their, in their point of view, they are considered as part of minorities, although we like to think of them as a separate group, because in some countries like Brazil, for example, they are a majority, but they are treated as a minority. You know, they are not represented in government, they are not having access to the same uh, political empowerment or economic empowerment, although they are numerically, they are actually the majority of the population. So there are challenges in this area in considering people of African descent, as I say, a minority because they, sometimes it just doesn't fit. So, um, uh, so the SG's call to action is really essential and is basically looking at us to say, okay, how do we have an agenda of protection that basically connects the dots from the international system to the regional system to what is happening on national systems. And I was very happy to see emphasis on your guidance on national institutions and national uh, na national actors that actually can bring that forward. What I would really appreciate is if you have best practices, if you think of things that could work, that work, it would be very good to feed, uh, feed that into UNHCR thinking 
thinking and, and our thinking, you know, if there are practices that you would like, but also challenges. I mean, like recently I realized that in a number of countries, uh, national human rights uh, institutions, which I did not even think about, it didn't cross my mind, don't even have the mandate to deal with racial justice and law enforcement issues because they don't have the mandate to deal with criminal uh, criminal law matters. So it, it can be complicated. But so if you spot some of these things, please, please, please don't hesitate to come to us. And my last point is about the partnership with UNHCR in the context of the network uh, that uh, we are uh, working together on. The network is, has been there for quite some time. It's basically focused on racial discrimination and protection of minorities. I think uh, I, I mentioned about this minority majority, all this stuff, it's, it's, it's an important thing to keep in mind. But, uh, uh, but I think what is important is that we have a system to work together uh, uh, on this. I think it's, uh, we have around 24, I'm looking at the number, I might be wrong, 24 entities that are working together on this. A lot of them are the specialized agencies, uh, uh, but we also have OHCHR and UNHCR. I'll be very honest with you, the big challenge for us is to make, make sure that uh, within, within the UN system that we also have the political actors with us. Because I think we can continue to deal with these matters as as humanitarian or as human rights issues. But what we really what would make the difference is that the, when they are put on the table as for solutions, when the sol political solutions are discussed by the UN. So the the importance of working together is really essential. So bringing in not only the development actors, the humanitarian actors, but also the political actors on, around the table to discuss to discuss what we would do for the protection of minorities and the, on racial uh, on racial discrimination, I think is really has been really a very 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 important because the solutions are often political solutions, as I uh, uh, as I say. So uh, so and I I think you know the the network. Um, was there, we provide, we created some guidance and so on, and then it dipped a bit, and now we are reviving it. We are reviving it a lot because from our OHCHR point of view, we see a big need. We see, you, you, can, you, you know all the crisis around you. We see a big need that the protection of uh, minorities and the, the protection of persons uh, irrespective of their identity, is central to the work of the United Nations. We feel that this is really important. So working together, working together on, on this is, is essential. Working together to feed into uh, best practices, making sure that, you know, we also connect at the field level, the same institutions connect at the field level, working together, bringing the discussions that we have at uh, HQ level to the to the field, uh, finding out uh, alliances within the field structures, within the country teams and the key field structures, so that we can work together on these issues uh, is really, really central. So uh, I would like to uh, finish by really commending you on this initiative, uh, how much we appreciate the partnership with UNHCR, we really uh, believe that we are both uh, OHCHR and UNHCR are working together towards the same, you know, to achieve similar goals on this. And we see a lot of uh, synergies, uh, both at headquarters and in the field. And we look forward to a lot more collaboration on this and other issues. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Mona. That was extremely rich uh, also with the five areas uh, that you outlined, but also uh, clear suggestions on how we could even strengthen the collaboration and how to move forward and build on what is already there. And also, I would say how you linked the guide to our work on a daily basis in the field, in headquarters, and the life around us in a broader sense. So thank you very much, Mona. 
And I would like to give the floor to our last panelist, uh, who is Juan Pablo Terminiello, uh, who will bring us the uh, experience from the field, from a uh, uh, region where racism, xenophobia is a, a very big topic and give us some concrete examples for inspiration and ideas how they are tackling it. Over to you, Juan Pablo. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you very much to colleagues and organizers for the participation in this panelists. It has been a real pleasure to share with with Mon and Guy. Really, I'm learning a lot and, and I would leave my minutes to them because I would like to continue hearing to them. So thank you. The idea of my presentation, the aim of my presentation, which would be very brief, is to introduce you on some of the practices and initiatives that have been developed in the context of the Americas regarding uh, violence, xenophobia and discrimination affecting persons of concern to UNHCR. The, the adoption of UNHCR new guidance on racial discrimination has been a good opportunity for the Bureau to take stock of the situation and the challenges at the regional level, but also to take stock of the different initiatives that have been and are continuing being implementing in the Americas to address the issue. And what I'm going to present to you is some of these initiatives that we consider are important and we would like to improve in the upcoming years. And next slide, please. I, I would use a presentation to facilitate. Before entering into the practices, I think it's important to, to, to put in context, which is the situation in the Americas right now in terms of displacement. Uh, the Americas, the region, has been facing unprecedented uh, numbers of persons displaced in the last years. We are right now account for 18% of, of population forcibly displaced in the world, according to UNHCR uh, global statistics. And this is due mainly to different situations that have aggravated in the past years, forcing thousands into, into cross-border displacement and also into situations of internal displacement. First of all, the, the Venezuela situation with more than 5.5 million refugees and migrants from Venezuela. Venezuela is at the top of the situations leading to displacement in the Americas. <clears throat> Secondly, we have the situation in North and Central America. There are approximately half a million refugees and asylum seekers from countries in Central America, mainly from El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras. But also, if we add to this number, the number of people internally displaced in those countries, we might be reaching right now approximately one million people displaced in the context of North and Central America. The deterioration of the socio-political situation and economic situation and human rights situation in Nicaragua has also triggered numbers, increasing numbers of Nicaraguans leaving and seeking international protection. Approximately 100,000 uh, Nicaraguans have requested asylum, most of them in Costa Rica, but also in Panama and in other countries in the region. And then we have a historical situation of internal displacement affecting Colombia with more than a million uh, internal displays in Colombia, even despite, despite and uh, even after the, the peace agreement that took place in 2016, displacement has continued to be a serious challenge for many Colombians in areas where uh, armed groups or criminal groups continue to operate. And the last situation that's also of concern to the region and which also involves high levels of discrimination and is connected as a root cause is the situation of statelessness, which remain an issue in many countries in the Caribbean, where we have stateless population or population at risk of stateless. Next, please. Just to, to continue giving you some, some, some information about the background, uh, we have received in the, during the past year increasing number, particularly after 20, 2016, we have received and registered an increasing number of asylum claims that led the Americas to become the largest recipient of asylum applications worldwide in 2019, uh, with approximately 1 million new asylum claims registered during the year. The increasing arrival of refugees and migrants in the context of the Venezuela situation or the situation in Central America and Nicaragua has exacerbated tensions with hosting communities. The number of, of, of people displaced across border has increased significantly. We, just to give you an example, we have more than 1.7 million Venezuelans in Colombia, approximately 1 million Venezuelans in Peru. And when, even when the numbers are not so big, in ca some Caribbean islands, Venezuelans account for one out of five residents of the island, which is, has transformed the landscape of all these countries and has leading to a mounting tension 
with local communities. And these mountain tensions are connected with uh, scarce resources uh, in terms of access to social services or rights like education, healthcare. And in the context of COVID-19, it has, due to the impact, socioeconomic impact of COVID-19, this has exacerbated. And we have a lot of competition, for instance, for the access to labor opportunities or livelihood opportunities, which is leading also to increased xenophobia and discrimination and stigmatization of displaced population in this context. The other element that we, we need to take into account, and it, it has become a reality in the Americas in the last year, is the, the, the implementation of restrictive migratory measures and border restrictions that are re reinforcing stigmatizations against refugees and migrants. And this is something very, very surprising for the region, because we have seen uh, since, since the, the beginning of this century a trend in changing and adapting migratory and refugee legislation to a human rights approach. And now we are seeing these things changing. And, and just to use some of the terms that Mona used, what we are seeing are increasing unmasked policies discriminating against people, or migrants and refugees. And this is a lot of, this generates a lot of concern to us. Some of these new policies involve the requirement of specific uh, requirements for, for refugees and migrants, such as, as criminal records, doing a link, very, very strong link, or trying to establish a very strong link between migration or human mobility and criminality and insecurity in hosting communities, or attempts to criminalize through criminal legislation irregular movements of migrants and refugees in the region. We have also been facing uh, challenges in terms of access to rights, and, and we have continued facing a lot of migrants and refugees, continue facing a lot of limitations in the access to rights and social services. And the other thing is how this interacts with, with political realities in the region and how increasingly we are seeing politicians in the Americas um, displaying toxic, toxic discourses against foreigners against migrants and refugees and this has been particularly of concern in the context of the Venezuela situation and the countries most affected by the arrival of people from this region. In terms of practice, next please. There are some, some key elements that we would like to highlight about that have served the purpose of better, than, better identify, analyze and assess the reality of uh, discrimination and xenophobia against population of concern. And one of the Key elements for the Bureau has been the issue of monitoring and analysis. And in this regard, what we can highlight is how we have been using protection information management tools to better identify discrimination or trends of discrimination against population of concern. And I'm going to give you just a few examples. One is the use of regular protection monitoring tools at the regional level and or high frequency survey that is being collected at the regular, it's regularly being collected at the regional level to identify patterns of discrimination. Not to identify why people is being discriminating or who are the people who feel discriminated, but also where discrimination is taking place. Is it taking place in the, in the hosting community? Is it taking place in the labor, uh, in the labor sphere? Is it taking place when trying to access uh, rights like health, education is taking place when uh, in the context of displacement, not when we need to, when people have to cross a border or initiate a migratory or asylum procedure. We have been collected all this information through high frequency surveys connected in all countries in the region. And in the case of the Venezuela situation, we have even been able to publish two reports of protection monitoring, which includes a sub chapter on the issue of discrimination, why people feel discriminated, where they are facing discrimination. We have also been working, apart from this protection monitoring example, uh, which, have, which are, we are conducting at the regional level, and now we are going to produce our report for 2020 that's going to tackle the Venezuela situation, but we will increasingly be tackling other regions and sub-regions in the Americas. We have also been working with specific profiling exercise or analysis exercise uh, addressing specific groups of people we forcibly displayed. For instance, one is and uh, a report that we are preparing and we are drafting with the Organization of American States on the impact of COVID-19 on people with a specific protection needs. And this involves different groups, including LGBTI people, but also working on the situation of indigenous communities. Indigenous communities have been severely affected by displacement in the context of the Venezuela situation. This displacement has posed a lot of challenges to UNHCR, but also to all partners and states involved in the response on how we need to adapt our protection response to ensure the protection of indigenous groups' rights. And this is something that has become a, a real challenge for a region that did not have 
a strong experience in dealing with indigenous population displacement in massive numbers. So one of the issues that we are going to focus is we are analyzing the situation of indigenous communities. We are working a lot with community leaders and the idea is to have at the end of, I think by the end of February, in collaboration with the Organization of American States, a, a discussion, an open discussion involving indigenous communities and their leaders to understand where are the challenges to ensure the rights in this new context that we are facing in the Americas. One element which has been key to everything we are trying to do in terms of discrimination and xenophobia is the engagement with key partners. And this involves mainly in the region, the involvement and the work with human rights mechanisms at the UN level, but particularly at the inter-American system level. We have a long, strong, long history of cooperation with the inter-American system of human rights in the region. And we are using this long history and these very strong links to work on the issue of discrimination. We are using our work with the inter-American system to document the situation of discrimination that are taking place in the region. The example is what we are doing with uh, groups in need of protection in the context of COVID and the indigenous. But the idea is to work with them to produce advocacy documents, policy documents, and specific reports that can inform what states are doing and what other partners are doing in responding to this situation. And this is a very important advocacy and policy making actor. This is the, the inter-American system is using the words um, of, of Mona. It, it's a key political actor in the region to promote change in terms of human rights. And now we are working more closely to them uh, on the issue of discrimination. We have historically been working with them on access to asylum, uh, access to the territory, but now we are really engaging a lot in the issue of discrimination. Next step, slide, please. Other, uh, just to, to reinforce some of the messages I think have been very important is the engagement with key stakeholders. And, and if I have to choose one specific key stakeholder to mention is national human rights institution. We have, we have strengthened our links with national human rights institution, which pay a lot of support in key areas working on the issue of discrimination. They have support and they work with us on issues of monitoring situation of discrimination, particularly in areas where it's very difficult for international actors to access and where they have strong presence through their offices, but also through their links with the community. So in terms of monitoring, in terms of advocacy, they are very powerful advocacy players uh, because of the constitutional mandate they have in many countries, because of the um, credibility they have in many countries, they are a key advocacy player. They are also involved in something that we have done in the region, which is litigation and legal support. Uh, national human rights institutions not only provide legal support to individuals in a specific case, but also get involved many times in strategic litigation, and they have been a key partner on that front. Uh, just to give you a, a very brief example of the importance of national human rights institutions, two years ago, in January 2018, we faced a situation, an outbreak, of xenophobic violence in, in a very in a medium-sized city in, in Ecuador, very close to the border. At that time, I was working in UNHCR Ecuador as senior protection officer. The situation was, was extremely complex. There was a, a crime committed by a Venezuelan refugee or migrant. It was a heinous crime. It was a femicide. And suddenly we had a strong reaction from the local community against Venezuela, where local actors, where political local actors were playing a lot of a very strong role in promoting violence and promoting uh, xenophobia against Venezuelans. It was a, an electoral, local electoral context, so the situation was very complex. We, we managed to arrive very early to the situation. The situation was terrible. During the night, Venezuela has been chasing the street. The places where they were leaving, the shelters were being chased, they were being attacked. Hundreds of them were leaving the city by foot, and we, when we managed to arrive there, we didn't know very well what, where can we start. The situation was terrible. And it was the, the, the national human rights institution there. It was the ombudsman that put at the lead of the movement. And in one hour, the national ombudsman has convened all local stakeholders, the local government, UNHCR, the Ministry of Social Affairs, the police director, the bishop, to a meeting. And we were taking decisions on how to address. And by the end of the day, the situation was under control. This is the key role and importance of these kind of players in this region. I, I don't know in other regions, but in this region, this is the, the key role that they can play. They, they can facilitate synergies to address situations of discrimination, structural discrimination, but also specific situations that might take place. Other key stakeholders with which we are working are parliaments, and this is in terms of reviewing and legislation. As I told you, we have seen increasing uh, initiatives of unmasked 
legislation against refugees and migrants and working with the parliament providing comments has been essential to, to prevent these to move forward. For, for instance, um, attempts to ban certain nationalities to enter the country or to put requirements that are impossible to meet for certain nationalities, attempts to criminalize irregular movements, which is something that we saw in countries like Peru and with a very strong stigmatization discourse within the piece of legislation that was being presented. Engagement with judicial actors has been also a, a, a key action and we directly or through our partners have been challenging some of these legal or policies, uh, are they, um, measures that have been focused, have, have been limited the access to asylum or limited the access to the territory or limiting the access to, to rights. And the, the last thing is something that we are, we are promoting very, very strongly since many years ago in, in 2024 when the Mexico Plan of Action was adopted, we start talking about cities of solidarity and we, we start working more closely to local governments, not only in delivering support and protection and assistance to refugees, but also to work in facilitating uh, cohabitation with local communities. And this is something key that we will plan to continue doing. We have some initiatives at the regional level. Uh, some of them are being funded by the European Union. We are working on this initiative with other UN agencies, such as UN Habitat, IOM, and many others. Working with community-based protection remain a key in the region, working with community structures. In many countries, community structures are very powerful, local councils, uh, in some communities where indigenous populations are strong, like in the Indian region, working with indigenous councils has paid a lot of support to our efforts to promote a Pacific cohabitation or to dismantle some of the discourses against uh, foreigners and refugees, and also to visualize which is the positive impact of refugees and migrants in these, their communities. Next, please. The other elements which which are traditionally part of UNHCR work in this region are related to the work with the media and, 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 and the working campaigns. I'm not going to mention this in detail, but I would like to, to highlight that in the context of the response to the Venezuela situation, coordination has played a key role. And UNHCR is, is working as part of this regional platform for the response to refugees and migrants from Venezuela, which has replicated its structure at the national levels. So in many of these countries, we have engaged uh, with the platforms and all stakeholders playing in the platform, which involves not only UN uh, agencies, but also tens of local organizations and international organizations, but in some cases also national government or local authorities in developing campaigns. Some of these campaigns, and you have the link there, have produced very strong messages on the positive impact of refugees and migrants in their communities, but they have also worked a lot um, to take down all the myth built again, uh, around migration and uh, around the arrival of refugees. We have also some campaigns have been uh, developed at the regional level, but also very strong campaigns in, in Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, with the participation of representatives from the entertainment industry with very strong messages in their communities, and also some, some efforts at the regional level to monitor a discriminatory discourse in, in the media and in social media so through the Peace Lab initiative in, in Costa Rica. In terms of working with media and journalists, we have our colleagues in the public information uh, section have uh, tackled the, this at the regional level. And what they have done, is, which is very important, they have partnered with very uh, well-known and, and prestigious regional institutions on, on media. One of them is the Fundación Gabriel García Márquez, the former Nobel Prize, it has, has a foundation, works a lot with journalists. They provide regular uh, trainings to journalists. Thousands of journalists for the region always try to, to access to these, uh, these, which are based on merits, on profiles. So what we organized in 2020 were at least two workshops on how to deal with human mobility, one in the context of Venezuela and a second one on the context of Central America, just to provide tools to journalists on how to reflect on these realities, how to reflect these realities, to establish distinctions between what is a refugee, what is a migrant, what are the protection needs of all this population, which is the, the positive impact, which are the challenges they face, which are the different profiles we found among uh, people, people's persons forcibly displaced. And the other one was in South America, it was journalism, journalists without tax, which in Spanish means uh, periodismo sin etiquetas, which was an initiative organized also with a multiplicity of partners to tackle a uh, journalist in, in the South American region. Next, please. I, I, I will I will end up I will end here. I think I, 
I am available if there's any question. Thank you again very much for, for the invitation and the possibility to, to participate in this. Thank you, Valerie. Over. Thank you, uh, Juan Pablo. And indeed, we have a lot to uh, to learn also from your experiences and the different initiatives you have been rolling out in Americas. And we could spend the whole day on exchanging around them. But uh, the time is passing. And therefore, uh, I would uh, bring to the panelists the questions that started to come through the chat box. And uh, I would invite uh, colleagues to take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions, your, uh, your comments, comments, suggestions, ideas, uh, uh, and examples. Um, I will start with the first round of questions and I will let the, the panelists to uh, divide them um, between yourself. So the first one is, uh, uh, is there uh, in a pipeline or planned any initiative uh, work around developing a universal list of racial categories? So more global uh, initiatives uh, around the definitions and consensus uh, around that. Second question is uh, in relation to your views uh, between the link uh, of uh, uh, refugee protection and the organization cultural work on racial equality, equity. So how do we link the work of protection of our persons of concern and the institutional work uh, within our respective agencies? Thirdly, um, with the COVID-19 situation, we have seen uh, that displaced place persons have been linked to the spread of the virus, unfortunately, in many contexts. Um, do we have any good practice examples or even lessons learned on collaboration with health uh, health actors in this regard to combat uh, uh, racism, racial discrimination and also misinformation? So with those three questions, I will turn back to the panelists and see uh, how you would like to address responses to this initial set of questions. Over to you. Well, maybe I can uh, address the first one, uh, which is uh, whether or not there, there's any work going on to further elaborate uh, who are the kinds of the groups of people that fall within uh, the protected group uh, under, let's say, the International Convention on Racial Discrimination. And, Yes, there's work going on all the time, and um, I, uh, I I want to uh, first of all refer you to the general recommendations of CERB, uh, because over the years uh, CERB has expanded. Uh, we would say really elaborated further <laughs> those categories that you can see in the black letter of Article 1 of the, um, uh, of the convention, uh, so as to add or clarify, you know, that indigenous peoples falls within the category of protection, uh, that, um, that uh, uh, you know, Dalits and people within uh, the uh, uh, scheduled caste if you will, fall within those categories. That in uh, many situations, you know, people uh, with um, uh, uh, medical conditions like albinism fall within those categories. That actually, although there's been a lot of uh, controversy about uh, people who are facing uh, problems because of their religious, um identification that you know we thought of uh ways in which and circumstances under which uh people such as the rohingya certainly fall within the category of protected groups under uh the uh, racism uh convention so yes the group is it, it is being as i say elaborated on um, on a continuous uh, uh, basis. But, you know, I think that uh, to the extent that there are specific uh, uh, questions about specific groups, 
What's that? It would be, I think, uh, useful to pose those questions to CERN. Uh, and that may trigger uh, thinking uh, with the outcome of a general recommendation that um, that in uh, very clear terms uh, might include uh, that category. It would be useful to know exactly who you're talking about. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, the, 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 there's more than what you can see on the surface of Article 1 in terms of the groups of people who are considered uh, to be protected under ICER. Mona, did you want to come in? Otherwise yeah, I no, I can comment. come in. Thank you very much. I think um, I'll just uh, briefly on the, of course, I agree entirely with Gay um, on the first question. On the second question, uh, on how do we balance the work with beneficiaries, work with the, the people that we work with, with our own human rights? And I think that's really, really an important point. As you know, the um, a number a number of institutions, UNHCR, for example, has uh, you know a diversity uh, officer. So they're basically the key is really to look in terms of how do we look at our own diversity and our own inclusion and our own our own policies and practices and to look deep at ourselves. I think that's that's really, really hard. DASG, as you know, has established, you may know, has established a task force to look at our internal, uh, our internal structures, uh, racism, uh, particularly in racism. And as you know, there was this survey some time ago. But I think now it's really the time is very opportune to look deeper at each and every organization, and there is a lot of organizations that are doing that, including in the private sector. And I think this is something that we cannot really push under the table. And I think the result, frankly, of really people standing up globally for their own rights is that there is a lot more awareness, you know, within organizations that re, that this is something that we need need to to look not only to look deeper but to fix the way i explain it to my my colleagues the way i look at it is that we need the un to be fit for purpose it's not about personal uh, interest i think the moment we see it as a personal interest just about us and me and my promotion and my uh, place i think then i don't i think we are losing something there I think so it's beyond unconscious bias and you know be, be people being overlooked and all this stuff i think the problem is that if we don't have proper diversity of voices in a very complicated complex world that is very interconnected but this interconnectedness is making us making people look more in silos and basically affirmations of their own point of view, the UN will be losing something very important. So diversity, frankly, is very important for the UN for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so I think, and but it's something that we need to work on in a, in a constructive way. We cannot just work on it as something that, you know, it's me versus them versus that. You know, a few trainings on unconscious bias, you know, making sure that, you know, in every panel there is. No, I think we need to look at it as a strategic, as as a, as a goal of strategic invo uh, importance to the, to the organization's relevance, I think. If we don't do it as part of the relevance of the organization, of what is going on today, I think we lose we lose the fight, because uh, because I think uh, I think I think with what the, the way the world is today, is really that's what the UN brings to the to the table, is the ability to speak with multiple voices, but in the same strategic direction, and that diversity of voices and diversity of views and diversity has to be heard within the organization has have to be expressed within the organization. Last thing I'll say about that 
is is that uh, I think there is a lot of awareness. A few years ago, you know, a lot of people would sit in panels with no women and have no problem with that. You know, no problem sitting in a panel that is totally male, just discussing. Today, it's everybody is conscious that you really need to have a woman's perspective, a gender perspective on the panel. Somebody at least looking different. I think it's happening the same with ethnicity and race, and that's really important to to consider. Uh, it brings in consciousness, but consciousness is not the only solution. Consciousness has to lead to different ways of thinking and different matters, because the end result is that we would like our organization to be effective and fit for purpose. And that's uh, that's really diversity is key to that. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I'll just say a couple of things briefly because I'm anxious to give an opportunity to other participants to speak if they wish. Uh, so firstly, on the definitions, of course, the impact of racism goes far beyond UNHCR's persons of mandate concern and our authority to pronounce on this uh, is, is probably less than that of some other entities. But this being said, we do want to contribute to thinking about ways in which this could could be clarified and uh, we could move towards a shared, uh, better shared understanding. In the guide itself, you'll see that we've included that in the definitions we've sought to put out there. And the term that has been used there refers to other key principles and instruments and aims to give our colleagues something concrete they can work with in their discussions with governments, potentially in development of policies or contribution to development of policies and strategies so that the work work can go on without being hampered or prevented by, by semantic discussions. So I think it's very welcome idea that this could be looked at further in the context of the committee or elsewhere, and we'd be very glad as HCR, I think, to contribute to advancing the thinking on that. In the regards organisational culture, the second question, I think it's extremely important not only for the effectiveness of our work in tackling the phenomenon of racism, uh, xenophobia and intolerance, but also our, our very credibility and legitimacy in uh, purporting to be a protection agency with mandate to promote rights. It's increasingly recognised. I think that doing this within the institutions is imperative and will be a process that will benefit every aspect of our work. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And I think, Mona, you articulated very clearly there the, the challenges around it. Yes, we need to become better at recognising our unconscious biases, uh, and that's going to involve some tough conversations. It's going to involve some tough measures, and it's going to mean that uh, we will need to change things in ways that won't be easy, but we can't shirk away from that um, uh, in order to be able to, to live up to our mandates and uh, be able better to serve our persons of concern. Finally, with regards to Anna Sophia's question on good practice in the medical center, I think that right now in the context of COVID, we're really seeing some promising practices there rolled out every day. If there's a few good things that have come out of the pandemic, hopefully this may be one of them. UNHCR, OHCHR and others have publicly welcomed measures taken by some governments to allow migrants and refugees to participate in the health sector. And we have seen instances where this seems to be really making a positive change to some attitudes and perceptions by showcasing the vitally important contribution that uh, newcomers can make in a much needed sector. So we want to document all of that uh, in the same way that the guide when it was published seeks to showcase a number of key good practices that have been collected over the years. This is going to be another area. We need to be able to continue to look for these and to identify them and publish them in order to bring life to our messages and our calls and to show really that it's in the interests of states and of communities worldwide to overcome prejudices and discrimination and to enable everybody to contribute to the maximum of their potential uh, for the benefit of all. Thank you very much. 
thank you very much uh, to all panelists for, for your comprehensive responses. And uh, I am aware of the time. Uh, we are coming to the end of our webinar, uh, unfortunately, because this uh, topic would dis deserve definitely a series of such webinars. And maybe this is something we can uh, look into in the future. And, uh, I would like to thank all of you. And before we uh, conclude um, with this event, I would turn again to Madeleine, please, if you could uh, bring us uh, to the conclusion of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. And let me also add my thanks, not only to our very distinguished panelists, but also to everybody who has taken part today and for the thoughtful contributions in the chat, as well as to the development of the guide itself. We appreciate very sincerely the very positive words that have been said about the guide today. And let me also pay tribute to everybody who was instrumental in its drafting, including Valerie, Peter and Ivona Truscan, who was a key drafter of this product. But of course, we're not here today just to congratulate ourselves on the issuance of a guide, which at the end of the day is a piece of paper. What we really want to do now is to take the words, the goals, the principles and the practices that we have identified there and turn them into action, turn them into initiatives that can make a difference for the lives of people on the ground. And specifically, the way in which we want to do that is to put ideas in the heads and tools in the hands of our colleagues in UNACR offices around the world, but also those of the many crucial partners that we work with. We've touched on issues today that go beyond international refugee protection and protection issues around IDPs and uh, stateless people. And so this, I think, really demonstrates how this has to be a collaborative effort. We need to draw on all of that expertise and all of that energy that our partners uh, can bring and help uh, and call upon them to keep informing us to criticize our efforts where they see areas we can strengthen them and try to continually update our knowledge and thinking in this area. So really, let me just thank everybody today for bringing us together in this way. I have learned a phenomenal about Mount myself. I can see that in many ways I work here is just beginning, but I see also enormous potential for follow up discussions at regional and national level. And let me just say that from UNHCR's side to our partners on the line, but also to colleagues in the field uh, from UNHCR, from DIP, that we're ready there to throw our energy into doing this and to support you as best we can in tackling racism, xenophobia and intolerance. Thank you so much. Best of luck to everybody and have an excellent day. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good rest of the day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.